Abraham Lincoln, the commander, coming up. I am the Crow. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Immediately after his election, Abraham Lincoln found himself in the worst crisis that ever happened in the history of the United States. Uh, it was an unprecedented crisis, so he had no counselors that had any kind of experience. Uh, he had no general staff that could uh, actually elaborate a strategy for the war. He had no think tank that were going to give him any sort of option for the policies. Uh, everything he had was, um, let's say, his intelligence, his ability to learn, and just a handful of trusted men. This is the story of how it pulled it through. Lincoln's objective from day one was restoring the integrity of the United States. And actually, restoring the integrity was indeed the legal justification for the war. Lincoln made it clear in many different speeches and many different letters, so we know for sure that he was borderline obsessed about uh, restoring the integrity of the nation. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half-slave and half-free. I do not expect the Union to be dissolved, I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the farthest spread of it and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in the course of ultimate extinction, or the advocates will push it forward till it shall become lawful in all the states, old as well as new, north as well as south. Why he was so keen on this? Well, this is still debated among historians. Some people say that the presidential oath actually implies to protect the unity of the nation. Some others say that it was just his constitutional duty. From a more cynical point of view, I think that he was concerned by the fact that leaving the South, uh, going alone, a uh, potentially rich market for the new goods produced in the North were going, was going to go away. And also, I mean, a large part of the influx of foreign currency into the then Yang United States was going to go away because the cotton export was the main good exported by the United States. Being the man that he was, I think he was genuinely concerned about two issues. The first was that the American states, if left unbound, they would have ended up like European states actually fighting for the resources of the new continent. But I think that the second reason, and probably the one that mattered the most, was that the failure of the Union of the United States would have been tantamount as the failure of democracy. When the United States were born as a democracy, uh, many people in Europe actually argued that the new form of government was not going to start. Admitting a split of the Union would have been the same as admitting that democracy was not a viable form of government. Both of these outcomes were intolerable, utterly intolerable for a man like Lincoln. So whatever the reason, Lincoln's target was clear at the beginning of the war. What he needed was a man to do the job. Uh, the first proposal for a strategic initiative came early uh, at the beginning of the war. Uh, General Winfield Scott, was the most respected uh, military thinker in the United States at the time. His was the translation of the work of Henri Jomini, uh, the textbook that was used at West Point to teach the art of military operations to the officers. Old Winfield Scott proposed a plan that later the press will dub the Anaconda Plan. So the plan was articulated in three points. The first was a naval blockade of 
the Confederation commerce, the second was the occupation of all the main ports of the Confederation, and the third was the acquired uh, the control of the Mississippi River. In this way, all the communication to and from the Confederation would have been crippled, the commerce would have plummeted, and so the economy of the Confederation would have uh, suffered from serious consequences. Winfield Scott actually had no illusion. He knew since the beginning that the war was going to be bloody, that the war was going to require a large mobilization of all the resources of the Union, and the overall effort uh, was going to be much tougher than everybody else was expecting. So the rationale of the Anaconda Plan was to strangle the Confederation and uh, put pressure on them while the Union was mobilizing its superior forces and was preparing an army to actually invade the Confederation. A clever plan indeed. Here Lincoln made his first strategic mistake of the war. Actually, the common sentiment of the public opinion, as oriented by the press, was that the war was going to be short and was going to be over in a few months. After all, they thought it's just a handful of rebels, they will be defeated and disbanded in no time, Richmond will be conquered and the Confederation will be brought back into the Union. That's what everybody was thinking. So Lincoln pretty much refused Winfrey Scott plan, caved to the pressure, pushed for the offensive. This brought to the first battle of Bull Run, which was a resounding defeat, an utter disaster, where uh, Washington itself was thought to be in um, danger of being occupied. At least after these events, nobody still thought that the war was going to be quick and short. At this point, Lincoln made his second mistake of the war. He appointed George McClellan as commander uh, of the Army of Potomac. And later, he will also be appointed general-in-chief of the Army of the United States. Uh, McClellan was actually the man of the moment. He was very popular in the press and with the public opinion. He was also very popular with the uh, troops because he was the only general that at the very beginning of the war actually obtained anything resembling a success against Confederation troops. However, McClellan uh, wasn't exactly what everybody thought he was. He was an exceptional organizer. He set out building the large army that was going to be needed anyway. But in terms of uh, field operations, well, his performance wasn't really impressive. He constantly refused to believe that he had numeric superiority over the uh, Confederate forces. In this, he was also misled by the Pinkerton Agency, but he was incredibly cautious by himself. His main battle plan, the Peninsula Campaign, will end up in an expensive failure. And even when he had all the information required to deal a blow to the Confederate Army, as it happened in the occasion of the Antietam uh, campaign, well, he failed as well. He was just too cautious, and that's the reason why he failed in actually dealing a decisive blow to the Confederate forces. Lincoln's error list doesn't end here. At the beginning of the war, he's also appointed a number of politicians as uh, generals, uh, even though they had no specific military experience. Characters like Fremont or Shimon Fanning really didn't bring any good to the cause of the Union. Lincoln's record as a commander in the first two years of the war wasn't really impressive. However, some signs of what was going to come were already present. For example, in the aftermath of the carnage of Silo, he refused to remove grants from his position. The journalist and writer uh, Alexander McClure really remembers. Late one night, in a private interview of two hours at the White House, during which he did most of the talking, McClure advocated with earnestness the removal of Grant as necessary for the President to retain the confidence of the country. When I had said everything that could be said from my standpoint, McClure proceeded with his story. We lapsed into silence. Lincoln remained silent for what seemed a very long time. He then said in a tone of earnestness that I shall never forget, 
I can't spare this man. He fights. While the Anaconda plan, as such, was actually refused, some other events actually brought it back into play. For example, in a very early stage of the war, Lincoln, under the pressure of the Navy, accepted and ordered the naval blockade of the South. The US Navy at the time wasn't strong enough to actually seal off the old commerce of the Confederation, but this will change over time. Second, about one year later, under the Navy pressure, the occupation of New Orleans at the southern end of the Mississippi River was actually enacted and successfully accomplished. Now, if we consider that the operations in the West were uh, concerned about actually getting control of the Mississippi from the North since almost immediately during the war, so what you can see that if the Anaconda plan as such was formally rejected, it ended up to be adopted in practice. Well, Lincoln deserves the credit of actually having admitted his mistake and having supported the enactment of the plan later during the war. However, in public opinions and Lincoln's mind, the Anaconda plan, the blockade, the operations along the Mississippi were all a sideshow because everybody's attention was focused on the eastern theater of operations in the stretch of land between Washington and Richmond. Lincoln's commander in the eastern theater actually disappointed him more often than not. Lincoln was under the pressure of the public opinion to deliver a decisive blow to the Confederation and try to end the war. So what he wanted was an offensive behavior. All the generals that take command in the East disappointed him because they have been either overly cautious or indecisive or created very conventional plans that were not really destined for success. Now, the point was that his generals were still thinking according to, to Domini's um, theory that they studied in West Point, uh, where the accent and the focus was placed on actually conquering uh, strategic uh, strong points and preserving the integrity of communication, which is actually important, but in itself is not going to win the war. What was necessary, according to Lincoln, was to destroy the enemy force. General justification was that the South had a decisive advantage by being able to operate uh, through interior lines. But Lincoln made clear his thoughts since January 1862 in a letter to General Don Carlos Buell. General idea of this war to be that we have the greater numbers, and the enemy has the greater facility of concentrating forces upon points of collision. That we must fail unless we can find some way of making our advantage an overmatch for his. And that this can only be done by menacing him with superior forces at different points at the same time. So that we can safely attack one or both. If he makes no change, and if he weakens one to strengthen the other, forbear to attack the strength of one, but see and hold the weakened one, gaining so much. So, what Lincoln was looking for was a general who was able to actually deliver a blow without sharing the burden with him. But all the generals actually disappointed him and normally this happened after a series of bloody and inconclusive battles. Even Meade, the winner of Gettysburg, disappointed him when he left the Confederate army slip away across the Potomac. During this time, Lincoln's uh, activity as a commander becomes more and more energetic, more and more peremptory. He tried to force his commander to actions, gave more detailed orders. Actually, at the time, he was understanding better the details of military operation and he was trying to orient his commander for good. Everybody disappointed him, save one man. So what Lincoln needed at this point was a man who was able to deliver a blow 
to the Confederate forces. And in July 1863, he thought that he found one. After the fall of Vicksburg, the 4th of July 1863, Lincoln wrote to General Ulysses S. Grant, I do not remember that you and I ever met personally. I write this now as a grateful acknowledgement for the almost inestimable service you have done to the country. I wish to say a word further. When you first reached the vicinity of Vicksburg, I thought you should do what you finally did. March the troops across the neck, run the batteries with the transports, and thus go below. And I never had any faith, except the general hope that you knew better than I, that the Yazoo Pass expedition and the like could succeed. When you got below and took poor Gibson, Grand Gulf and vicinity, I thought you should go down the river and join General Banks. And when you turned northward east of the Big Black, I feared it was a mistake. And I wish to make the personal acknowledgement that you were right and I was wrong. Lincoln has always followed Grant's career with particular attention and indeed Ulysses Grant was a general of a different breed from his predecessors. He was not afraid to fight, he was not afraid of taking responsibilities and under the weight of responsibility he didn't become overly cautious or indecisive or he never took uh, particularly ill decisions. It will take some time, but the 2nd of March 1864, uh, Grant was appointed as commander or in chief of all the forces of the United States. Lincoln and Grant actually shared the same vision on how to bring the war to an end, so it was relatively easy for the two men to find an agreement on the conduct of the operations. They had a few disagreements, for example, the original Grant's plan was to land a force on the back of Richmond in Carolina to manage the, 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 the communications of the Confederates. This was not approved, but at the end of the day, this not held the grant back of pursuing a very aggressive, very offensive strategy, which was what Lincoln had asked for since the beginning. In the very moment he realized that Grant was going to act in this way, he actually released his pressures on his activity, he stopped being pushy and let Grant do the job. And as we all know, Grant at the end delivered. Uh, Grant's operation were not without controversy. Many in the Union actually accused him to be a butcher, to waste an excessive amount of forces. But okay, the results are now there to speak for themselves. Actually, Grant in about one year accomplished what the other generals were unable to accomplish in three. He destroyed the Confederate army and brought the war to an end. So how was Lincoln as a commander during the war? What strikes me is, is that he was very adaptable. At the beginning he relied on his generals and he was disappointed. However, he progressively increased his understanding of military operation of warfare and so he began to try to influence his generals to do what he believed was the right thing. In hindsight, we can say that he was basically right. Pretty much give him almost. However, in the minute he found a person who was going to deliver, he relinquished his control on the day-to-day -day operations and gave him almost carte blanche. So, what is the overall judgment about Lincoln as a commander? Well, I gave you some facts. I leave the judgment to you. Now, thank you very much for watching, goodbye.